Hello, everyone. This is your host, Susan Rosen. And I have a guest today who I'm really excited to have on the podcast. His name is Robert J. Davis. And he is also known as the Healthy Skeptic. And he is an award-winning health journalist whose work has appeared on CNN, PBS, WebMD, and in the Wall Street Journal. Very impressive. The author of four books on health, he hosts the Healthy Skeptic video series, which dissects the science behind popular health claims. And Davis holds, I should say Robert, Davis, Robert Davis holds an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a master's degree in public health from Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health, and a PhD in health policy from Brandeis University. All very impressive schools. I'm, I'm, I am very impressed. His new book, which we're going to talk about today, is titled Supersized Lies, How Myths About Weight Loss Are Keeping Us Fat and the Truth About What Really Works. So Robert, welcome. And um, very excited to hear about what works. Thank you, Susan. It's great to be with you. So tell me what led you up to writing this book and, and what, did, what did you learn from it as well? Well, well as you uh, referred to in the introduction, I am, I've been a health journalist for many years. And so I've reported through the years on all kinds of health-related issues. I also have a personal passion when it comes to health and wellness, nutrition, exercise, try to practice what I preach. And, and so uh, I also have an academic background, as you noted, in public health. So in my work, I've tried to combine my academic background looking at the science. So we have all kinds of claims about so many health issues. Certainly that's come to the fore more so than ever with COVID, with all kinds of conflicting, uh, contradictory, uh, incorrect information. So what I've tried to do with my background in public health and epidemiology is to look at the science, actually look at the studies and help readers and viewers understand what the science actually says as opposed to what the claims say. So that's some issues. And certainly through the years, I've reported a lot on weight and obesity related issues. And, and, and I am inundated as all journalists are with all kinds of press releases of people making all kinds mm -hmm. of claims. And so I've tried to employ the skills that I have to look at the science behind those and try to set the record straight for the audience. And so in this book, um, that's what I've tried to do, focusing just on uh, weight loss and obesity, going through a lot of the most common claims, helping people understand what's true, what's not, what's half true, so they can make better decisions for themselves. So as I see it, I'm not here to tell people what to do. I'm not mm -hmm. setting out a you know, one size fits all diet plan. But what I'm, I am trying to do is to set out the truth about what we know from scientific studies, laying out principles so that people can make better decisions for themselves. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Especially because <clears throat> unless you do that, people don't really take it in and make it a part of their life. You know, right. and I, it'll and, just and be another fad. Right, and I think that's an important point because people have to take it in and then figure out what works for them. That is such a key. You know, sometimes we, we, you know, we, we look to somebody to tell us, what should I do? Do step one, two, three, four, five. And these, as I say, one size fits all diets. And that's a big problem because everybody's different. Not only are our bodies different, but our preferences are different. Our lifestyles are different. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important to take the information and, and figure out which of the, how to apply that information in a way that's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And maybe as we talk a little bit too, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we can talk and we don't have to do it right this minute, but also about how, as we age, things change, right? Our bodies don't, don't, um, we don't burn calories in exactly the same way or as quickly or you know, all of that as, as when we're younger. Um, I don't know whether it's just because we're more active when we're younger or, you know, what the, 
Well, and all, it, that's true. And then also uh, hormone levels change as, for example, as women go through menopause, estrogen levels drop and that affects the accumulation of body fat, especially right. around the abdomen. So there are yeah. physiological yeah. changes that yeah. happen. And yeah. so what's important there is that people have to change their expectations about what's realistic. It's not yeah. to say they can't have a healthy weight and they can't mm -hmm. feel good about themselves and how they yeah. look, but it is to say that what's realistic to expect of yourself when you're 65 yeah. or 70 is different than mm -hmm. when you're 20. Yeah, and so that's important yeah. for people to be aware of, or 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 the way that some of these books, you know, these fad books that are out there, the way they talk about food and health and all these kinds of things. A lot of times they don't talk about the differences in age. That's absolutely right, and that's a crucial uh, distinction that needs to be considered as people are looking at this information. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I and I do have to point out because I just did a podcast actually on it is it's not up yet but um that men go through their own version of menopause called andropause yes correct yeah. and the same thing happens with men and their 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 drops in testosterone and that uh -huh. has similar effects with, the, with regard to uh right. the positive body fat and so yes absolutely yeah. and so it's not just a it's not just just women who are affected men are affected as well certainly yeah 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 it's i just had to point it out because there are not many people who realize that. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's always our fault. <laughs> men, are, men, are, men are just as affected. <laughs> so, okay, well, why don't you, why don't we, we take a step kind of back and, and talk a little bit about some of these different diets. We don't have to get specific because we don't need to get lawsuits or anything about it, but you know, about um, some of the diets over the past, I don't know, couple of decades, because there've been a lot of them that are, oh yeah, do this, do that. You know, you'll lose, you'll lose 20 pounds in five days. And it's like, mm, I don't think so. Right. And one of the things, sure. And one of the things I try to trace is the history of uh -huh. some of these ideas, particularly diets that restrict certain foods or categories of foods. I have a chapter, a whole chapter called Pick Your Villain. Yeah. And I trace the history of this starting in the 1970s with the idea that fat is bad. And we all remember that, all of us who are old enough, that fat is the enemy. And so you eat fat, you get fat. And you remember all the the, the foods, the fat-free foods, which were snack wells, cookies, and all the rest, that if you eat oh these God, foods, yes. you can manage yes. your weight. And so yeah. people uh, latched onto that idea <clears throat> during the 1970s and 80s. And what do you know? Not only did it not work, the problem got worse, actually. People yeah. got fatter, and we ended up with an epidemic of diabetes. Now, experts debate the reasons for that, but we just know that it was a failure, that that strategy did not work. So then we get to the next era, which is I call the Atkins era. That is the, okay, fats are not the enemy, carbs are the enemy. So <laughs> Dr. Robert Atkins, who'd been around for a long time, said if this diet that you're following, this low fat diet's not working. So instead of cutting out the fats, find eat fat, don't eat bread, don't eat potatoes, don't eat starchy foods. And that's the solution um, to weight control. And so the, what we found out though, is when studies were done, head to head comparisons of a low fat versus a low carb diet, what study after study after study has shown that after a year or so, it doesn't matter. They result in the same amount of weight loss and that over time people start to regain the weight. Sometimes a low carb diet may have a slight advantage in the short term over a few months, but over the long term, which is what really matters, um, that, that there's no difference really. But yet we continue to have, and now we have later versions of this, it's whether it's the keto diet or whether there are fasting mm -hmm. diets or diets that eliminate gluten or diets that are um, a detox diets, the list goes on and on, but, but trying to say there's some kind of villain or particular behavior that people are engaging in. And if you just eliminate that food or that category of food, then <clears throat> that's the secret to losing weight. And so what we know is that it's just not that simple, mm -hmm. that weight management is far more complex than a specific food or categories of food. And yet this idea continues to be very powerful. And certainly the food industry benefits from this because they continue to crank out all kinds of foods that are free of whatever the villain is. So the foods that are fat free, the foods that are carb free, the foods that are sugar free. Um, and what do they do instead? They put in artificial sweeteners and we can talk about this more, but those aren't necessarily weight friendly and they actually can, foods that are sugar free can contribute to weight gain as well, paradoxically. So. Yeah. 
the point is that uh, that this idea of these diets that focus on specific villains have been shown again and again, not necessarily to be any better than any other way of eating when it comes to weight. In some cases are actually harmful because they can actually remove foods in our diets that we need. A keto diet, for example, um, you know, there are, it doesn't have whole grains, which are important uh, mm, for fiber. It doesn't have mm. other nutrients. Certain uh, fruits or many fruits are not uh, allowed. Certain vegetables aren't allowed. So that when you start restricting whole categories of foods, you can have nutrient deficiencies. And so um, mm. the point here, I guess the bottom line is any diet's going to work short term to help you lose weight. Mm. Pretty much any diet will because it'll reduce calories and reduce the amount you eat. The question is, is it sustainable? Is it healthy? Is it something that's going to be beneficial both in terms of your weight and your health over the long term? And I like to think the problem with diets is by definition, they're short term for most people because in most cases, they're not sustainable. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think the important thing is to sort of focus away from the, all these diets and to look at overall eating patterns. That's the solution. How you eat overall, the overall quality and composition of your diet and, and, and focus on that as a long-term strategy that's sustainable. Yeah, oh, no, I, I, I totally agree. And that, that makes so much sense. Um, I think the other thing too is people, some people have, have issues. I mean, they have actual physical problems, right? And then they try and go on one of these other diets and all it does is exacerbate that no question right and those problems are they can be any number of problems yeah. including um people that are prone to eating disorders and so some of these oh. one of the other things that's very troubling about certain diets is that they exacerbate an unhealthy relationship with food so people who are prone to eating disorders going on these diets can actually make those problems worse and so that's one of the terrible consequences I talk about in the book uh -huh. that can yeah. occur from dieting and from being sort of uh, 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 believing some of these ideas about, well, these foods are villainous, these foods are poisonous, mm -hmm. these foods are toxic, never eat them, and contributing to um, yeah. th those kinds of, of unhealthy relationships with food. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And especially because there's, there's, also, there's also a lot of people who are saying, oh yeah, if you have immunity, immune disorders or something, then you should be on this kind of a diet. Or, or you know, if you've got, you've got you know, brain fog or something, then, oh yeah, go on a keto diet. Or, you know, they're very, they try and, and put together the diet with some particular issue. And you know, it would be nice if we could has. do that. It's an appealing Wouldn't idea it? and it's, it's yeah. precision. The idea, it's, it's a, the term precision medicine refers to this idea of individualizing treatments, in this case, diets uh -huh. for specific people and specific conditions. And it's something that science is working on. And, and hopefully someday we'll be there. We can say, if you have this condition or you have this kind mm -hmm. of um, issue with your weight, then this diet is best for you. But right now, mm -hmm. honestly, the evidence doesn't allow us to do that. And when people do hear that a particular diet, and now there may be a few exceptions certainly, but in general, um, mm -hmm. a, a, a particular diet is good for a particular condition. In most cases, um, the evidence is not there. And that particularly by, when made by people who are pushing diet books or certain kinds of diets, um, they are jumping ahead of the evidence or they're basing it on evidence in animals or in test tubes and not on really yeah. robust clinical data. Yeah, 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 or just a, a few people right now who again seem, there are who, who feel better right right and there are exceptions we know that certain diets will help keep your cholesterol lower we know that certain diets are better for diabetes so again i'm not saying it's across the right. board but yeah. in general um as you point out there are lots of claims with regard to diet and mm -hmm. conditions that are not yeah. substantiated by the evidence yeah yeah oh exactly exactly um yeah and it's do you think it's something, well, I guess I was going to say that something about human nature that likes to just have a, a all in one answer? No question. I think to, that's a, an excellent point. I think we're looking for simple answers and it's understandable. It's human nature and it's, it's, it's human nature also to be able to point to a villain and say, okay, this problem, the problem is X. And if I can do away with X, then that will solve my problem. Yeah. Um, 
as I point out the flip side of that, and I have a chapter on uh, heroes, dietary mm -hmm. heroes. So if you eat certain foods, that will also help weight loss. So whether it's apple cider vinegar or avocados oh, okay. or chili peppers. So it's a flip side of the same phenomenon, which is oh. to say we look for simple answers and heroes as well as villains. But again, unfortunately, I wish it were the case that we could pinpoint specific heroes or villains and that be the key. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, that weight loss, as mm -hmm. I said, is a very complex uh, issue. It's a weight regulation is very complex, involves a number of factors, both biological, environmental, and to boil it down to either a villain or mm -hmm. a hero and say, this is the answer, um, doesn't cut it, even though the, the impulse to believe that is certainly understandable. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And like we were saying a little bit, we touched on just a, a tad bit is what works for me is not necessarily going to work well for you. Exactly. And, right? that's, so, and that's so important to, for people yeah. to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I, I love eating avocados, but not everybody else necessarily either likes them or should be eating them. You know, I mean, they, they do have a lot of fat in them. Well, you know, it depends on what the rest of your diet looks like too, right? I mean, it's just, right. um, yeah. And, and Susan, I, I think that's a very important point with regard to looking at other people because this also, I think, contributes to what, what I consider to be perhaps the biggest problem of sort of diets and diet culture mm -hmm. is that people, when the diets don't work for them, how they uh, engage in self-blame and th feeling that they're failures and uh, internalized yeah. statement, all the rest. And yeah. so- when you look at someone else and say, well, it worked for my friend, they lost 50, 30, 40, 50 pounds, and I'm not losing weight. Therefore, yeah. I'm a failure. I didn't do it right. Yeah. I'm not diligent enough, whatever. Uh, uh -huh. I, and I feel shame and self-blame. Well, it may yeah. have nothing to do with how hard you tried. It probably <laughs> doesn't. It has to do with how your body is different from someone else's. And that gets to differences in genetics, differences in metabolism, differences, as you said, in, in perhaps an age all kinds of other factors that we don't necessarily have control over that mm -hmm. determine how effective a diet or an eating pattern is going to be for us in terms of right. losing weight. And so I think yeah. that's a really important point. And too often, not only do people get their dieting advice, maybe from other people, because something seemed to work for somebody else, they get it from celebrities. So they see these people with perfect bodies, perfectly sculpted bodies, people on Instagram <laughs> showing pictures of their oh, yes. bodies and their weight and so forth. And yeah. it will work for her, it will work for me. Well, not necessarily. But then yeah. it's important for people to understand that so they don't uh, engage in th these kinds of destructive uh, mm -hmm. thoughts, this destructive thought patterns about themselves when the diets don't work for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing that came to mind as you were, as you were talking about that is that we change as well, right? So what helped us to lose 20 pounds may not be totally what we need to maintain the 20 pounds off. Right. Right. Sometimes you know, we, we stick with the same thing and then all of a sudden it either starts to go back or you start to not feel as well, or maybe you even lose too much weight. Well, right. And that's an important point because as you say, we change specifically our metabolism changes. So as yeah. we, for example, right. cut calories and lose weight, our, metab our metabolism actually slows down. So we have to eat fewer and fewer calories to maintain that weight. It's, it's actually an evolutionary gift to keep us from wasting away in times of scarcity and famine. And thank goodness, most yeah. of us don't have to face that, but it creates yeah. a terrible problem for us when we are trying to lose yeah. weight in an environment of plenty, because we do have to keep eating fewer and fewer calories in order to maintain that weight, because our body is basically fighting us. It's trying to keep our weight, push our weight back up, keep us from wasting away. So uh -huh. we're essentially fighting biology as we lose weight. Uh -huh. And that's something that often is lost when these diets are presented to people, it's well, just keep on this diet and you'll keep losing yeah. weight. And it, again, it's not nearly that simple. Yeah. And it's funny because I have never heard anybody say that, you know, not in any of the books, not, not when you see people on TV being interviewed or any of that kind of stuff. Well, and one reason perhaps is it's a discouraging thing to hear. And, and yeah. I, you know, I, I think nobody wants to hear you try as hard as you want, but your body's going to fight you and you're fighting biology. That's a very intimidating thing to fight. Um, and so 
the truth, but the the good news is though, it doesn't mean that it's hopeless. It doesn't mean there's nothing you can do. It yeah. doesn't mean that you you might as well give up and not try, uh, because as I talk about in the book, there are ways of of approaching weight maintenance and weight loss that uh -huh. um, can be successful. But you have to do it recognizing the facts about biology and and how the body works. Yeah. Well, and you talk a bit about uh, exercise as well in the book. And yeah, and I said, right, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, 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 I was going to say just, you know, why don't you tell us a little bit about that and how that plays into all of this. Yeah, and this is another big myth, you know, and I say this, by the way, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an avid exerciser. I actually, my last book was all about exercise. Uh -huh. Everybody should exercise. I think it's the closest thing we have to a fountain of youth because it can do everything from you know, reduce the risk of heart disease and cancer, heart disease and cancer to help improve your mood, improve your sleep. I always say if there were a pill, help your brain. I always say if there were a pill that could do all the things exercise could do, you'd all be clamoring for it. It's it's truly remarkable. Oh yeah. That said, one of the few things it cannot do very well, if at all, is to help you lose weight. And so <laughs> what's ironic is that's the number one thing many, if not most people look to exercise to do for them to help them lose weight and so yes. often they're disappointed because yeah. it doesn't result in the weight loss they expected and they give up they said well this is futile this isn't working so i'm not going to exercise and that's completely mm -hmm. the wrong thing we should exercise everybody should find a way to be physically active in a way that works mm -hmm. for them but to do it for the right reasons and that is because it's going to help all these things i just mentioned help them feel better um, but not necessarily to help them lose weight. And the reason it doesn't help with weight loss is that number one, it doesn't burn that many calories. So if you go mm -hmm. for a walk, a brisk walk, that's going to be great yeah. for your health, for your heart, for your, yeah, for I was your, say your heart and yeah. for a lot of things, but it's not necessarily going to burn that many calories. And so you're better off, you know, not eating a cookie. That's going to actually be more effective than, you know, mm -hmm. going for a walk. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one reason. And then also, again, just as when we cut calories, our bodies respond, just as even if you exercise a lot and you burn five or 600 calories a day, which is a lot of vigorous exercise, which most of us are not willing or able to do, but let's say you can, again, your body's gonna respond. Your body's going to adapt in certain ways to slow your metabolism down, to increase your appetite, um, and, and, and even make you perhaps move around less in ways you're not aware of when you're not exercising just to conserve energy. So. The point is that even when you do that, your body's going to react. And so you may not end up losing as much weight as you would expect from that kind of calorie burning or any at all. So mm -hmm. again, uh, okay. it's, this, it's, it's analogous to cutting calories and that the body's going to respond and make it more and more difficult to lose weight that way. Um, yeah. so, so I think that you know, we hear often the secret to weight loss is eat less, move more, sometimes called ELM, E-L-M-M. -M. And I like to say that for many people, Elm Street is a dead end because they try so hard, they cut calories, they exercise, they find it doesn't work or they say, you know what, I, I ate extra food. I, I indulged more than I wanted to last night or over the weekend or over the holidays. So I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to, yeah, I'm gonna go to the extra. gym. And, and yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't, that, that doesn't burn enough calories typically to make the difference. And so people become very frustrated. Um, and so again, I think it's important to understand the realities of our biology so that people can take actions accordingly and not just keep banging their head against the wall when what they're told doesn't work. Yeah. So what kind of thought that just came to mind is as people are losing weight or have lost weight, you know, um, is that something that they need to, that they need to think about? and um, really look at, I know, you have, I know you talk about maintenance in the book, right. um, but particularly, you know, we were talking earlier about, about people as they're getting older. Um, is that, does the maintenance in the, in the book kind of apply to that as well, even if you aren't specifically yes. saying that in the book? Yeah, and, and, and one thing you, you uh, that, that's relevant to the conversation we're just having about exercise. And yeah. this is an important point is that while exercise cannot necessarily help you lose weight or is not an effective way to lose weight, it's very important when it comes to maintenance. That is not gaining weight, preventing weight gain in the first place or preventing the regain of weight that you've lost. So the studies do show that exercise is very important for that. 
um, oh, and okay. an important part of maintenance. And so um, there's study after study shows that people who exercise regularly and there's the, 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 the studies vary in terms of how much is necessary, but generally the amount that's recommended for good health, that is to say, uh, 30 minutes a day, five days mm -hmm. a week of aerobic activity. Again, you can break it up into small chunks and a couple of days a week of resistance training. And that doesn't uh, have to mean going to the gym. You can use body weight. You can use cans at home. You can use bands, uh -huh. any number yeah. of ways. But that kind of uh, regimen can is crucial when it comes to actually preventing weight gain or maintaining weight loss. And so that's, a, and that's, yeah. that's really important uh, to keep in mind so that, again, to understand how exercise can be beneficial and what it can do for you versus what it's not so good at doing. Um, and then beyond that, there are all kinds of other steps people can take, important things people can do in order to maintain their weight. Um, because, you know, again, as we've said, most diets can help you initially lose weight. The, the real challenge is how do you keep that weight off? That's because something very, very kind of uh, disappointingly, uh, something like 97% of people report regaining lost weight. So the question is, are you going to regain most of it or all of it, or can you minimize the amount of regain? And again, right. having doing, doing certain things uh, to minimize that weight regain is what's crucial. Do, do people have a tendency to lose more than they actually need to lose? Well, that's an excellent question, you know, and, and I, I have a whole chapter about this in terms of figuring out what your ideal weight is. You know, what should you weigh? Because uh -huh. we hear about BMI, the body yeah. mass index. That's the standard yardstick for determining whether somebody is at the right uh -huh. weight, whether they weigh too much, whether they weigh too little. Right. And, and I talk about the shortcomings. There are considerable shortcomings with BMI. So sometimes people may be told you are uh, obese, you need to lose weight. When in and, you, and people try to lose weight when in fact, they're not uh, obese. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of muscle, or uh, okay. um, uh -huh. or, or their or their their weight is higher because of bone and muscle, which is not okay. reflected in BMI. Um, on the other hand, people may be told your weight is fine, and according to BMI, in fact, they may have excess body fat. So, the the, the problem is that it's hard to know um, what your quote ideal weight should be. Um, one way of determining it is using waist circumference. Some doctors oh, use that okay. as an alternative to BMI. Mm -hmm. so that um, that can be a better indicator of your metabolic health. But the way that I li like to look at it is I think a good way to think about what a good weight is for you is what is, at what weight are you healthy? Meaning you're mm -hmm. metabolically healthy, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood okay. sugar and so forth. Mm -hmm. And at what weight is sustainable for you? What, at what weight do you, can yeah. you be on a healthy diet and sustain that weight without going up and down, without yo-yoing and, mm -hmm. and continue that weight for or more or less for yeah. the long term. And I think that's you know not a weight you necessarily got off a BMI chart, not a weight that you weighed 20 or 30 years ago, not yeah. necessarily your lowest weight ever, not a weight of somebody you saw on Instagram or that your friend said they got to, not a weight mm -hmm. you sort of pulled out of the air, but a weight that's yeah. healthy and sustainable for you. Right. I, mean, I think that's an important thing to consider as you're looking at you know what should I weigh? And sometimes yeah. you're right, people will shoot for weights that are too low or not sustainable for them uh, and their bodies fight back. And so mm -hmm. it's, and it's uh, involves a lot of trial and error. Everybody's different, obviously, but finding that sweet spot, that air, that weight that's healthy for you that you can sustain over the long term is really uh, what's important. Okay, okay. And then um, when we were talking about, you know, people as they start aging, right? Right. things change. Um, are there particular things in, in, a, in their diets that they should be looking at, maybe changing up, maybe not eating as much carbohydrates, maybe eating more protein, or maybe not, maybe it's the other way around. But you know, I mean, I, I realize all of this is very individual. Right. Right. I mean, bottom line. But are, are there some kinds of things that just seem to pop out um, when you look at, as people, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, I mean, people are, are living a whole lot longer these days. It's so normal almost to see 80 year olds running around, you know, my, my mother is one of them. Yes. Well, there you go. I mean, yeah. my, my mother was in her mid nineties when she passed and that was, you know, I don't know, 10, no. 2014, about eight years ago, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the short answer to that is that, again, science isn't 
at a place where we can pinpoint and say people in their yeah. 60s, 70s, 80s should eat more. But we, we know some general things. We know, for example, eating, getting more protein is important okay. um, just because we lose muscle mass as we get older. So getting more protein is important. And, and, and trying not to only do is exercises. Absolutely. The, doing the resistance bearing. exercises. Absolutely. Weight bearing. That, that is crucial as, because we lose muscle mass. And so maintaining that muscle mass is important for two reasons. Number one is that it keeps people from getting feeble. They're, they're able to sort of continue, continue doing everyday activities more easily by having more muscle mass. Yep. And also muscle uh, burns more calories than fat does. Okay. So the more muscle we have, the more calories we can burn. And that's one of the reasons as people get older, they tend to put on weight sometimes because they have less muscle mass and that burns less ca fewer calories than fat does. So the more you can maintain muscle mass, the better. And the two ways you do that are through, number one, through resistance training, as you say, and number mm -hmm. two, through eating more protein. Um, and the other advantage of protein is it can help fill you up. So many people find that eating more protein leaves them less hungry. So they're more, they're less mm -hmm. likely to overeat. Yeah. And so that's yeah. another advantage yeah. of getting. And so I, I think one thing that many people recommend is just getting some protein at every meal, instead of getting all your protein okay. at dinner, make sure um, you get protein throughout the day. So and maybe different kinds, different kinds of different protein kinds as of well. Protein. So, yeah. so uh, not just if you're, if you're, you know, you eat, if you're omnivore, you can eat animal protein as well as vegetables and beans. And, and yeah. there are a number of different sources that aren't necessarily, uh, if you eat dairy, you can get, eat dairy as well. Okay. Protein uh -huh. from dairy. Yeah. So yeah. you can get yeah. protein from a number of different sources. And is that, if protein's good for your brain too, I think, isn't it? I think there's some, certainly getting enough is important. You yeah. know, a deficiency yeah. can be, can be harmful. Yeah. Um, and, but I think also, uh, we, we should be, I think it's important to point out, we shouldn't be afraid of carbs either. Again, some of these diets that we talked about have made people mm -hmm. afraid of carbs and not eating carbs, but you know, they're, they're quote, good carbs and bad carbs. And they're right. the kind of carbs that aren't good are the refined grains and, and highly processed foods that we see from yep. things like chips and crackers and soda and sweets and so forth. And um, I think bread. we want to keep those right, white bread. Exactly. We want to keep those to a minimum, but we want to mm -hmm. emphasize complex carbohydrates, whole grains, uh, beans, uh, brown rice, um, you know, complex carbohydrates that really are the fuel for our bodies. Glucose is what fuels our bodies and, oh, okay. and gives us energy. And so we want to make sure we have enough energy. So I think it's important to not be afraid of carbs, but understand that it's important to get the right carbs. And that, I think that's key. Um, certainly as we get older to make sure that we're, we focus on that. Um, yeah. Something else that's important is getting enough water. You know, one of the, I think in general, it's a myth that when you hear people that you need eight glasses, well, everyone needs eight glasses of water yeah. a day, but it is true as we get older, our sense of thirst in some people um, oh, is not right. as acute. And so yeah. maybe uh, they can't necessarily rely as, as easily on their, whether they're thirsty or not to know whether they need yeah. to drink. So sometimes just making sure that you're hydrated as you get older, getting enough water is important, not only for your health, but again, it can be helpful for your weight because there are studies that show that when you drink more water within 30 minutes or so of a meal, it can fill you up and you eat less. So yeah. um, eating, drinking right before a meal gets a trick that can work uh, to, for some people helping them to reduce okay. their uh, calorie intake. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that and and I can identify with that. I um, I have noticed that I, I drink less water. You know, I'm not as thirsty. I mean, I've got my cup of coffee here, but, um, and you know, that counts and, by the way, people sometimes don't count coffee, but it I does know. count as your fluid intake. I know, I know. Isn't that exciting? Um, <laughs> but I do, I do have to remember, I literally have to remember, you know, I mean, I drink it to take my vitamins and all that kind of stuff, but I really have to remember to keep some water on my desk and keep drinking it. You know, yeah, I, mean, I do the same thing because yeah. I'm the same way. As, I won't feel thirsty. And then I realize I've gone for hours without a drink. Yes. Again, that becomes more and more of an issue as people get older. Yes, uh, yes. So yes. that's why keeping water nearby at all times yeah. is a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it affects it affects our bodies as well, right? Because the water helps to get the toxins out and, and, and all of that. And, um, you know, that's how we all end up with, with bladder infections and, and it has, stuff like and interestingly, that. It has some cosmetic effect potentially too, because when people are hydrated, it can make their skin look more wrinkled. So, um, so it, it, that's drinking my extra problem. water won't, won't extra, extra water won't make your wrinkles go away, 
but having too little water can uh, can bring out more wrinkles. Okay, no, no, that makes sense. Is that why my lips are always chapped? <laughs> <laughs> they always feel dry. I think it's the coffee. But anyways, I digress. Um, yeah, that that's that's really that's really interesting. And and you know, and there are so many other things as well. It doesn't necessarily, like you say, coffee, juice, although you have to be careful of the sugar, right? right but there are certain right. kinds. Um, and um, of course, if coffee is and tea is, um, but there's so many different ways eating fruit. Yes, you get water from foods, you get water from yeah. fruit, you get water from vegetables. So yes, absolutely. Yeah that's a source yeah. as well yeah yeah so i mean people because i i know some people are i know my mother used to always oh i don't like drinking water it's like well there's a hell of a lot of other things out there you can eat or drink you know? right and you can add if you add flavors or you can add fruit to the water a lot of people do that just add a little orange yeah. or lemon or, or other fruits into your water and give uh -huh. it give it kind of a a sweet a little bit of a sweetness and then people yep. that makes it more palatable yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah so any other any other pointers for people as they get older to to be on the lookout for that they uh that they should well you, you know, know one thing one thing to... that i um think is one of the things that i recommend and i talk about the book is keeping a food diary uh mm -hmm. and again this is something that people don't necessarily <laughs> They have to do all the time every day throughout their lives but sometimes if people find that they are not reaching their goals whatever they may be in terms of their weight i think a lot of people find it very helpful just to keep a food diary you don't have to do it uh indefinitely as i said but do it for a few weeks and what keeping a food diary entails is writing down every day after every time you eat and you can put it in your phone and then transfer it over to a notebook or put it in your computer or mm -hmm. your apps to let you do this but just writing down not only what you ate, but how much you ate, where were you were when you ate, who you were with when you ate, were you by yourself, were you with other people, oh. how you were feeling when you ate, how you felt after you ate. So keeping track of not only what you eat, but your emotions and the environment mm -hmm. and so forth. And then writing it down honestly. And it's important to do it as you're eating because you know I, I can't remember what I ate last week, you know, or this morning, much less last week. Right. So it's important yeah. to do it as you're going along. But then the whole point is that you get a record of, of your eating patterns of what was happening. And then you can look mm -hmm. at, at it and say, okay, I realize that when I'm alone, I eat more or I eat less, or I realize that um, when I was feeling down, I ate more junk food, or I realize that when I'm in a hurry, I tend to scarf down food in the car and I eat less healthy foods. And on those yeah. days, I don't get foods that are filling, whatever it is, I think mm -hmm. it can be very helpful. And so sometimes as we get older, our, our lifestyles may change because mm -hmm. of retirement, because of other changes in life, mm -hmm. um, emotional changes, things we're dealing with, whatever the case may be. And those can affect our eating patterns. And so I think it's important if we really, and, and sometimes we're not even aware of that. And so the point of keeping a food diary is to say, okay, I'm gonna keep a record here so I know what I'm doing, which I may not otherwise be aware of. So then I can take actions to say, okay, I realize that when I'm feeling lonely or I'm feeling down, I start to eat more junk food. And I know okay. that instead I yeah. can have a plan that when that happens, I'm gonna call a friend or I'm gonna to listen to music okay. or I'm gonna go for a walk or something uh -huh. like that. So that you, you have uh, not only a record of what's happening, but then you can develop a plan to deal with the, some of the patterns you see that may okay. be contributing to uh, to weight gain or issues with your uh -huh. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I, and just to interject, I mean, something else as well is when you feel like you want to have a piece of cake or something like that, you know, take, take a piece of fruit. Right. See if that doesn't satisfy, you know, my husband and I have gotten into the habit of, you know, cutting up an apple and we just share an apple after dinner. That's dessert that get that sweetness but you don't have to get all that other sugar and, and and white flour and other things that are in right and know, that's in that's the case exact, and exactly and finding alternatives that work for you and that for every again everybody yeah. it's going to be different what works for right. me is a piece of dark chocolate i love dark chocolate. Uh, there you go we I have, have some of that very low, i'll eat one or two squares of dark chocolate which is low very low in sugar and yes. that satisfies my sweet tooth 
Now, there's yeah. plenty of other people who hate dark chocolate, including my yeah, family members. They can't believe I like it. And they don't but, think it's but, sweet, right? <laughs> right. But it works for me. And so yeah. what works for me, obviously, is not going to work for somebody else. But yeah. that's the key is finding the thing that's going to work that's for you. That's right. Absolutely. 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 So talking about sugar and sweet, you know, give us the, the two minute rundown on, on sugar and the different kinds of sugar and, you know, what to kind of limit a little bit, shall we say? <laughs> right. Well, you know, there's all kinds of discussion. And one of the things I talk about is, you know, sugar is one of the villains where people say sugar is the number one cause or people who say, you know, prominent doctors who will say mm. that mm. sugar is the number one villain. And again, the evidence doesn't support that sugar is the number one villain when it comes to weight. Now that said, it doesn't mean that eating a lot of sugar is good because most of us in, in American culture eat too much sugar because sugar is not only in the foods that we think of as sugary, it's put in all kinds of other foods from spaghetti sauce to bread that we don't even yes. know we're getting it. So we eat a lot of sugar. So I think it's good to be aware of sugar. So when you think about looking at foods, look at the late nutrition label and look at how much sugar it has and, and, and take that in consideration when you're thinking about how much sugar to eat. Now, as for what form is worse, you know, we hear a lot about high fructose corn syrup is worse than regular sugar, honey's better. But the truth is that to the body, sugar is sugar. Generally, the body mm -hmm. processes sugars the same way. So, so just because it has honey, just because it has brown molasses, just because it has some healthy sounding form of sugar okay. doesn't mean it's better for you. And this is a marketing trick. A lot of foods uh, will, you know, just a touch of honey, yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which it can be misleading on two levels. What is a touch? A touch can be a lot. There's no science. According to whom? Legal huh? term, yeah, what a touch is. It could be 10 or 12 grams of sugar. And uh, then the honey is not necessarily more helpful than table sugar, sucrose. Yeah. So I think, I think we, it's important not to be tricked by these marketing terms, these health halos that are applied to foods to make us think it's a healthier mm -hmm. form of sugar. So, so I right. think the point right. is that we should be aware of sugar as one component that contribute to weight gain. Sugar is not by itself poison or tox, poisonous or toxic, but it is something that we want to try to, uh, you know, we ought to eat less than we're eating and to be yeah. aware of it, just yeah. as we need to be yeah. aware of other components of food. Yeah. Well, and it, and sugar, like, like a lot of things, anything in large amounts typically is not real good for you. Correct. Right. I mean, just if, if for no other reason than the fact that it's pushing out all the other good things that you should be eating. Right. And, and again, Along as I said, we, we have a yeah. lot of sugar in our diet just because of the way it's yeah. added to so many products. Well, that, yeah. Um, so a yeah. lot more than we, we are aware that we're getting often. Yeah. Yeah. That that's what we always look at on the label is how much added sugar. Yes, added sugar is that's put the in there. Thing. Right, as opposed uh, in to general. But but I should I should add. We, you mentioned fruit juice earlier. Mm -hmm. Most foods that have naturally occurring sugars are thought to be help more helpful than foods with uh, sugar that's added. But there's some exceptions. Fruit juice being one exception. Um, mm -hmm. Fruit juice does have lots of vitamins and minerals, but it also has lots of sugar. Now it's naturally occurring sugar, but studies do show that this sugar can, and the, drinking a lot of fruit juice can contribute not only to weight gain, but also diabetes, as opposed to eating whole fruit, which has the opposite effect. Right, so the fiber. That does it, that's exactly because the fiber, because it slows down the, uh, the absorption of that sugar. Now that's mm -hmm. not to say you should never drink fruit juice. I drink, I like fruit juice, but I just keep my quantities limited. I don't drink a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I love yeah. orange juice, so I just don't. I, uh, I keep it very limited to a few ounces. So, so again, uh -huh. it's a, it's not a matter of this food's off limits or it's toxic. Never touch it. If you like it, it's okay to drink fruit mm -hmm. juice. Just don't assume that it's you can drink as much as you want and it won't have any consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and again, look at how much added sugar is put right. in. And yeah. if I mean, if it's just from fruit and nothing else, it yeah, should be just sweet from enough. Fruit, you still right. It's it, you still need to watch it for fruit juice, but I think you're right. Uh -huh. Particularly if it's added sugar, these sort of fruit beverages that add sugar, th those are certainly much even more of a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I guess we could probably, between you and I, we could pro probably go on for hours, but we should probably try and wrap it up a little bit here. <laughs> so, okay, so here, here's Robert's book. Everybody can see Super Sized Lies. Um, it's, it's very readable. I have been reading it. Um, and, and I like all the little things about, you know, calling out what's a myth and what's the, what isn't. Um, and, 
it's um it's been very educational and i've been i've been looking at all of this and reading about all of this for 30 years so it i still found still definitely found things that were new to me so i appreciate that well well thank you that's that's nice to hear thank you yeah yeah and and like i say it's very it's very readable the way the way it's organized is is also very readable you don't go oh my god what is he talking about right. Well, I, I, you'll see, readers that are interested will see I have over 300 citations and, I, and I've combed through thousands of studies, but I've really tried to make it accessible. So to try to explain the science in a way that anybody without yeah. a scientific background can understand. While, but if you are interested in the science and reading more about the studies, they're there, they're in the back. I refer to lots of studies and you can go look them up if you'd like, if you're so inclined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I may, I may. Um, okay, and I will also, I will put a link to uh, Amazon, to the book in the show notes, if anyone is is uh, interested in going out and grabbing their own copy. Um, and okay, so is there any just kind of wrap up thing that you'd like to say to kind of, you know, the the, the very, 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 very short version of, um, of the I, book? I would just say, <laughs> that there are lots of things we hear that are not true and it can be very discouraging but at the same time my message is don't be discouraged there are things that you can do that can be effective and so it's a matter of following those steps and i outline them in the book and uh -huh. not getting discouraged and, and not becoming cynical and throwing up your hands and saying well nothing works everyone's lying to me but knowing there are things you can do to not only maintain a, a, a weight that you're satisfied with, but also be healthy. And, and again, in the end, it's being healthy that matters yeah. the most. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And to create create a, a healthy diet, and I don't mean that in, in cutting calories diet. I mean, just, a, just what you eat um, that's, that's going to work for you because exactly. we, all have, we all have things that we like to eat and things that we don't like to eat, right? I mean, you, you talk about beans and that's great. My husband loves beans. I couldn't get down a thing of beans, regular beans, if I somebody paid me. Well, maybe if somebody paid me, but not, not voluntarily. So, I mean, we all have likes and dislikes. Right, that's, absolutely. That's being human, Yep. right? So find, find what works for you and go with it. Absolutely. And I, and I hope that people can, if they look at my book, they can find, I try to lay out some guidelines to help them do yeah. that. Yeah. No, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for writing it. Well, thank I appreciate you, Susan. It. And thank you for having me. It's been fun talking to you. Yes. Thank you. And I will say that neither of us are doctors. This is not to be seen as medical advice. Although I guess technically you're a PhD doctor, but it's not an MD. Um, and um, if you do have an extreme problem, you might want to get your doctor involved when you're going through the book to get their input in helping you develop the right diet that's going to be right for you and your health. And so with that, I will say goodbye. Thank you again to Robert. And I will see all of you next week. <laughs>